Um, just before we get started, just letting you know that there's going to be like a huge amount of different pathologies on this list, um, but it's not a comp comprehensive list. So a little disclaimer out there. So in the um, interest of time, I'm mainly going to be going through the pathophys um, and some of the relevant signs um, for some of the ones that I believe are more important to know. Um, some of them are more related to ECGs, which we'll be covering later. And I'll try to go through it really quickly because I know ECG is probably the hardest topic that you guys are covering in this last week. So we'll hopefully get to that pretty quickly. Um, alrighty, so we'll start with angina. But before we start with angina, we need to talk about atherosclerotic plaque formation. Um, so the basic um, how-to is there's going to be chronic stress on your endothelium. Um, this leads to endothelial dysfunction, um, which means that you're going to get um, inflammation of this vessel wall and then you get macrophages that are attracted to this inflammation and macrophages are going to ingest cholesterol from LDLs um, and they transform into these things called foam cells. Um, and our foam cells are going to accumulate and they're going to eventually form atherosclerotic lesions. And these lesions um, are going to form plaques and they're going to occlude and cause coronary obstruction and they might even rupture. Um, so going into angina, so angina is sometimes described as reversible myocardial ischemia. Um, it's got three main features. So you can have constriction or heavy discomfort to the chest, jaw, neck, shoulders, or arm region. Um, you have symptoms that are brought on by exertion, so like physical activity, going upstairs, um, running, anything like that. Um, symptoms are usually relieved within five minutes of rest. So those are the three main symptoms that you'll see in what we call typical angina. So if you've got all three features, you've got typical angina. If you don't have all three features or you only have like two of the features, then we say that it's atypical angina. Um, we can also further categorize angina into two main types. Um, so stable and unstable. So stable angina is going to be ones that is induced by effort and relieved at rest, and it has a pretty good prognosis. Unstable angina is um, where you have increasing frequency or severity, and it occurs on minimal exertion or rest. So um, it's unfortunately associated with an increased risk of MI, so it probably doesn't have as good a prognosis. And to test angina, you'd usually conduct an ECG, which is what we're going to be getting to. Um, all right, so we'll move on to myocardial infarctions. This is essentially just myocardial cell death, so the cell death of the heart cells. Um, and it's going to be caused by prolonged ischemia, so lack of blood flow to a region of cardiac tissue. Um, it's related to plaque formation, so in particular due to partial or complete occlusion of a particular coronary artery, and depending on the coronary artery, you'll get different signs and symptoms as well. Um, so over here, you've got the pathophysiology of just the plaque formation and how it's going to work. Um, we can also further categorize myocardial infarctions into unstable angina and um, STEMI and STEMI, so ST elevation basically and non-ST elevation. Um, we'll talk about the last two in ECGs um, and we've covered unstable anginas before. Um, and Izzy's gone through the anatomical differences as well as the significance of difference of like the difference in left and right dominant heart, um, but they're here on the slides as well, but mainly talking about how it's different um, for like the, what ventricles are affected and um, just what could be worse, basically. Uh, all right. Um, so on this slide, there's um, the first histological image is just of a one day old infarct and it shows a bit of necrosis. Um, on this slide, you've got a two to three day old infarct and there's like, you can see, start seeing some like dense neutrophils that are um, infiltrating the um, cardiac tissue. Um, this one over here shows almost complete removal of like the necrotic parts um, that have died from ischemia, um, the necrotic parts of the heart. Um, so it's around seven to eight, 10 days after the MI has occurred. And so if we skip to the last one, we can see that this is an old um, MI and it's healed as well. Um, but the most important thing is that the myocardial tissue hasn't actually regenerated. So instead, it's just become a dense color, like it's just become dense collagen. So collagen is all the blue bits and you can see that a lot of it is blue. Um, so there's lasting impacts of an MI on a patient. All right, so we'll move on to talk a little bit about cardiac biomarkers as well. Um, so biomarkers are going to be cell contents from myocytes which are released when they basically undergo ischemia um, or when they undergo necrosis. 
So in other words, um, biomarkers are usually contained inside cardiac cells, but when we have ischemia necrosis, they get shoved into the circulation. So we can measure them um, when we suspect an MI. Um, different markers are going to be released and raised at different times, and so they're going to have their peaks at different times, and so we can measure them at different times, and so you can see that on the graph. Um, as you can see, troponin is this huge one over here, and troponin is the most important cardiac biomarker as well. Um, it's measured four to 10 um, hours after an MI, and it peaks around the 12 to 48 hour mark. Um, and it's also really important to know that troponin has a degree of elevation that correlates with the size of the infarct. So if you've got a really big infarct, you're going to have a really like a much larger troponin release. Um, CK or creatinine kinase is the other biomarker I wanted to highlight to you guys. Um, so there are going to be three isoforms, but CKMB is the most specific to cardiac tissue. Um, it does have like a short half-life, so it's not commonly used, but it's also useful just to detect reinfarction. Um, there's also natriuretic peptides and C-reactive proteins on this slide. So natriuretic peptides are just released by atrial distension and by the left ventricle in response to stress or stretch. Um, and C-reactive protein is quite um, non-specific to heart conditions because it's just an inflammatory protein that's predictive of like any acute phase inflammation or even cardiovascular disease. All right, um, so we'll move on to heart failure. So you may have heard of heart failure as congestive heart failure. So they're both basically the same thing. Um, and the easiest description I can give is basically when your cardiac output is inadequate for your body's requirements. That's literally all heart failure is. Um, so the failure to meet the body's requirements is going to be due to some changes that are happening in the myocardium itself. Um, so the main known causes of heart failure um, are diabetes, um, diabetes mellitus to be most specific, hypertension and coronary artery disease. Um, so these three are mainly implicated because they're going to cause ventricular dysfunction um, and with ventricular dysfunction comes a low cardiac output. Um, we also have left and right-sided heart failure. So when we're talking about the main, main symptoms, left-sided heart failure leads to pulmonary edema, dys, um, dyspnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, right-sided heart failure will mainly lead to peripheral edema, ascites, and JVP distension. So we talked about more of this last week in clinical skills. Um, so I've just got a chest x-ray with a left ventricular heart failure on this slide. Um, so some of the notable things that you can see is that there's edema or fluid. Um, so it's definitely not like a clear kind of chest x-ray. Um, and the heart is also going to be quite enlarged in this case as well. All right, um, so we'll move on to our valvular disorders now. Um, so starting with aortic stenosis. So this is a valvular disease that is going to be characterized by narrowing of the aortic valve. Um, as a result of this narrowing, we have an outflow or a decreased outflow of blood um, from the left ventricle into the aorta, and it's basically due to the obstruction. Um, so as a result of this obstruction, there's chronic and there's excess load on that left ventricle because not as much blood is going through. Um, and so we cause, and it can actually be a cause of potential left ventricular heart failure. Um, there are three main symptoms of aortic valve stenosis. So it's syncope, angina, and dyspnea, or SAD, um, is how I like to remember it. Um, alrighty. Um, aortic stenosis is continuing over here. Um, all right, aortic regurgitation. So it's another valvular heart disease, um, and it's going to be characterized by the incomplete closure of the aortic valve. So this is basically going to cause a reflux of blood. So in the previous one, in aortic stenosis, not enough blood was going through due to an um, obstruction. Over here, there's no obstruction, but the valve just doesn't close properly. So every time when we go through our cardiac cycle, there's going to be a reflux of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. So obviously that's not going to be ideal. Um, so it mainly occurs like after bacterial endocarditis, which we'll cover a little later, or an aortic dissection. Um, but there can be like chronic causes such as um, like congenital bicuspid valve or rheumatic fever. So just abnormalities of the aortic, um, aorta structure. Um, so coarctation of the aorta is a congenital heart defect um, and it's going to involve narrowing of the aortic lumen. 
and it's associated with other congenital heart defects as well. So I've got PDA on the slide. So if you're wondering what PDA is, um, it just stands for patent ductus arteriosus. So that's that small blood vessel that connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery, but it should be closed after birth. So note that your coarctation of the aorta might be asymptomatic, especially if a patent ductus arteriosus is present. Um, this condition is also heavily associated with Turner syndrome, um, and it's often accompanied by like a bicuspid aortic valve. Alrighty. So I won't cover arrhythmias in too much detail at the moment, just because it's more relevant for ECGs. But the bottom line is, is that an arrhythmia is just a disturbance of your cardiac rhythm. Um, and it's actually much more common than you think. And it's often quite benign. So it can reflect underlying or it can reflect underlying heart disease. Um, you can split the causes of arrhythmias into like non-cardiac versus cardiac. And you can see that, especially in the non-cardiac causes, there are things like caffeine or smoking or alcohol and drugs, which probably a lot of us have gone through um, or experienced. So arrhythmias are definitely much more common than we think. All right, so thoracic outlet syndrome. So I believe you guys have covered it in anatomy. So I'll skim through this, but it's mainly just an overarching term for conditions that involve the compression of neurovascular structures. So like the brachial plexus or the subclavian artery or vein as they're going to pass from like your lower neck to the armpit. So causes of this can be mainly due to trauma, um, tumors, or like the presence of the cervical limb, um, cervical rib, sorry. So a cervical rib is just like that extra rib that arises in some people. Um, it's an anatomical anomaly and it arises from the seventh cervical vertebra. Um, so it's usually asymptomatic, but it can compress that lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So the C8 and T1 roots um, or the subclavian vessels. So that will lead to your thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, aortic dissection is just a tear in your intima layer of the aortic wall. So you're going to get blood entering um, between the intima and the media or the um, media or the adventure at really high pressure. So it separates these two layers and it can actually cause like a false tear or a false lumen. Um, and so this will lead to the obstruction of your aortic branches and it will eventually go to ischemia. Um, aortic aneurysm is dilation of the aorta and it's usually due to weakened um, like a weakened blood vessel wall so depending on where it is you'll have different symptoms so broadly speaking if it's in your abdominal section then you'll feel like a pulsatile abdominal mass and you might have lower back pain if it's in the thoracic um, aortic section then you might find like pressure in the chest and thoracic back pain um, all right, so pericarditis is just inflammation of the pericardium and it can be acute or chronic. So acute is usually involved with some sort of viral infection. So common viruses, so mainly Coxsackie virus, but you can also have EBV, CMV, adenovirus or rheumatic fever. Um, and yes, yeah, so as I said before, Coxsackie is the most important one that you should remember. Um, if your pericarditis has lasted longer than three months, we now say that it's chronic. Um, symptoms are as you'd expect. Um, so usually there's going to be like central chest pain that's worse on inspiration or lying flat. Um, a pericardial friction rub can occur. And if there's a viral infection, the patient might also have um, like some systematic signs, so like a low grade fever. Um, all right, so cardiac tamponade is just a complication of pericarditis and it involves the compression of the heart and especially implicates the right ventricle. Um, and so we won't go through that too much. Um, all right, so uh, okay, so cardiac arrest is just the stopping of the heart's mechanical activity. I don't think I need to go through this in too much detail because it's pretty self-explanatory, but obviously if you stop your myosarch, you're not going to get any blood flow to the circulation or the organs, so you're going to get ischemia, cell death, organ malfunction, just everything. All right, so I'm not going to cover pulmonary hypertension in too much detail because I don't think it's too relevant to the year one course. But if it's there, if you've heard about it, um, it's here um, just to go through it. All right, um, so for some more generalized pathologies, um, so we'll go into the apex beat. So the apex beat is the point of maximum impulse, and it's usually palpated in your left fifth intercostal space. So if you can't feel it on examination, there can be a number of reasons as to why it may be displaced. So the main ones are cardiomegaly. So cardiomegaly is when your heart 
basically like went to the gym for some underlying patholo um, like pathological cause and now it's just really big um, and due to its increased growth the apex speed has now moved or been displaced to another plane. Um, you can also have mediastinal shift that's not going to be too important for this year um, or dextrocardia so you might have heard of dextrocardia and that's basically where your heart is going to point in the opposite direction so it's reflected like on the right hand side. Um, alrighty. We also have intercostal bundles that are running between our innermost and inner intercostal muscles in the intercostal spaces. Um, so they're usually inferior to the superior rib. So it's really important that if you want to stick anything in, make sure that it's superior to the rib or inferior in the intercostal space. So we don't want to implicate these vessels over here. All right, and to finish it off, hoarse voice. So this can be due to a left recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. So left um, the left, left recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of your left vagus nerve and it just loops under the aortic arch. So it's really vulnerable as collateral in this location. And when it gets damaged, you basically have a hoarse voice. So that's the main indication. Alrighty, so that's pretty much it. So now Xenia is gonna take you through infective endocarditis and ECGs. Um, so I'm just going to be running through infective endocarditis and some other cardiovascular infections. Um, infective, infective endocarditis is the main one and very likely you will be asked a question on the exam about it. All the other ones that aren't very important, so I'll just skim through them. So what is infective endocarditis? So it's a very serious uh, infection of uh, the heart, mainly the heart valves, but it can also um, involve the atria, ventricles and other large intrathoracic vessels. Um, predominantly, it affects the aortic and mitral valves, but it can also affect the, oh, sorry, jumped ahead, the tricuspid valves um, in drug users. All right, so this is definitely important. Um, very likely, you might be asked a question on this, so please remember aortic and mitral, and then IV drug users, that's a buzzword for tricuspid valves. Uh, and yes, mortality approaches 100% without treatment, so you need to pick up on this. Uh, that's why I think it's important. So there's some causative uh, pathogens of infective endocarditis. So for infective endocarditis to actually happen, you need two things. You need the organism somewhere in your bloodstream that will then get to the heart and then something going wrong in your cardiac endothelium. So the endothelium is just the lining of the cardiac tissue. Um, and basically there's something wrong with that lining that will help facilitate the bacteria to actually attach to that endothelium and then grow. All right. Uh, and that's to do with uh, abnormal blood flow. If it's more, if there's more spaces, there's more bacteria around that will then adhere to the wall. Uh, that's why you need that sort of statement. So there's a, a few um, pathogens that unfortunately you definitely have to know. Um, so there's a few pathogens from the mouth uh, that can cause IE, which is strep virodans and strep mutans. Um, I think varidans is a little bit more buzzwordy than mutans, but you should probably know both. So after a dental procedure, um, you have a patient come in with infective endocarditis signs, it's very likely that it's one of these two organisms. Uh, so IV drug users, um, they generally have staph aureus causing this infection and sometimes fungi. Uh, and you can kind of think about how it gets through uh, on the skin. So staph aureus is sort of found on your skin and it'll breach that and go into the bloodstream and then to the heart. Cardiac surgery tends to be a fungi, a fungus cause. Colonoscopy is E. coli. Again, E. coli is a resident in your gut bacteria. Um, and strep virus is another one uh, in your GI flora. So definitely remember these. Um, likely you'll be asked either the dentist procedure or you'll get a drug user. Um, and remember drug user is a tricuspid valve as well. That's really important. Uh, where's my second point? Okay, there we go. So there's two types of IE, acute versus subacute. So acute, generally, every time you see that word, it just means something happens quite suddenly. It's usually quite bad. Um, and this is the case for IE. So it happens quite suddenly over a few days, okay? Um, and it's generally by staph aureus is the most common cause of acute IE. Um, and so a very highly virulent organism. And generally, these people will have... Um, a predisposing condition, so they'll have other heart conditions um, with this. Subacute is the other type, so this will happen a bit slower over weeks and months. This is generally strep virodans, um, very low virulence organism, and this will affect abnormal structures. So sometimes uh, these patients might have a prosthetic heart valve, for example, um, they very well could have a subacute IE. So there's a bunch of clinical features of infective endocarditis. I've underlined the ones that I think are more important. These ones obviously still could 
come up, um, but less likely for your exams. So focus on the ones on the left here. So they have uh, malaise, cardiac murmurs, cardiac failure, paraxia, which is just fever, petechiae, which are these sort of like small dots, I guess, hematuria, which is uh, blood in the urine, osmo nodes, splint hemorrhages, and genway lesions. So osmo nodes and genway lesions, I guess, are discolorations of your skin on the hands. The difference between them is that osmo nodes are actually painful, whereas Janeway lesions are not painful. You can refer back to um, Faze's other presentation about clinical science, because I know she did um, a few slides on them, so it's pretty good. And splinter hemorrhages are basically uh, discolorations in your nail, um, which are pretty indicative of an RNA. And so definitely, especially these last three, I would say they're really big buzzwords for IE, so definitely memorize them. So there's some risk factors, so being uh, of older age, being male, um, poor dental hygiene or recent dental procedures, again, that strep viridans and strep mutans, that can cause IE. And then you have all these other cardiac issues, so structural heart disease, valve disease, in general heart diseases, prosthetic valves and cardiac devices. Um, and again, because you have um, the chance of introducing other organisms, organisms with uh, prosthetic valves, cardiac devices, um, and abnormal patterns of blood flow, um, leading to sort of that bacteria adhering to the endothelium. That's why these are all risk factors. So there's some investigations for IE. It's very specific. They just want you to know this because this was in the lecture, um, at least for us last year, and I'm assuming you might have had the same lecture as us. Um, so blood culture is the number one main investigation for IE. There are some other ones like ECG, CRP, and some other ones, but blood culture is the number one. Um, so we actually do three different blood cultures and the first and last have to be done at least one hour apart. Um, but even if they all come back negative, it doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have IE um, because they can still actually have fungal IE. They can have a subacute or end of chronic infective endocarditis. So these are the three. Um, it might be worthwhile remembering them. If you're too pressed for time, I don't suggest it because I don't think it's that important. Um, but these are the ones that could um, still exist even if the blood culture comes negative. Um, so for some reason, they really want you to know that. There's some other infections of the uh, cardiac system. So myocarditis, all the um, next ones are not very high yield, so I'll just quickly run through them. So myocarditis is inflammation of the myocardium. So it's just the muscle in the heart. Um, and basically that can lead to uh, different arrhythmias. And so arrhythmia is just an abnormal heart rhythm. Okay, that's just a fancy word for a change in heart rhythm. Uh, Myocarditis is un unfortunately a really common cause of sudden death in young people. I think in our lecture last year they talked about how most of the time they diagnose myocarditis post-mortem um, because there's not a lot of symptoms leading up to it and it's just very sudden cardiac death in young people unfortunately. Um, so it can be an infectious thing, so viruses are most common cause, that's probably the only important thing you need to know about myocarditis is that viral is most common cause, but it can also be non-infectious. Um, so it's just different things. It can have other clinical features, but as you can see, number one is still sudden death, unfortunately. Mediastinitis um, is just the inflammation of the mediastinum. So the mediastinum, you should remember from anatomy, is just where all those structures sort of sit in the chest. Um, and there's a few different causes. So esophageal perforation. So you should know that this topic is kind of runs by quite close. So obviously if it's perforated, your content spills out. There's probably bacteria there other pathogens there and that can cause an infection. Cardiac surgery also pretty self-explanatory, you know, introducing organisms. Head and neck infection doesn't seem as self-explanatory, but basically your head and neck is actually connected to your chest. Um, yeah, you'll learn, <laughs> you'll have a fun time learning about that in second year. Um, but yeah, basically an uh, infection in your, in your head or your neck specifically can cause immediate sinatus. And there's some uh, cause of organisms, but they're not very important. You also have superitus thrombophlebitis. I really don't think you will ever be asked this on an exam, but basically the only thing you need to know is that it's inflammation of the actual vein wall, um, and it's associated with thrombosis, so it's those blood clots, um, and bacter bacteremia, um, which is um, bacterial presence in your blood. Um, yeah, and there's some causes of organisms. Again, I really doubt they'd ask you, that'd be really neat. <laughs> Um, mycotic aneurysm, so again, aneurysm is just when your um, vessel is sort of like dilated um, and basically these are, this is a specific type of aneurysm uh, due to an infection, okay? Uh, and this can be a, a complication of infective endocarditis as well. So it can be its own thing or it could be a complication. 
Um, and these are some clauses, so uh, I'm not going to go through them again, but I think it's really important just so you know what it is. Lastly, briefly going to mention acute rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. You cover this a little bit more in second year as well, it makes a bit more sense, I think. Um, so basically, um, acute rheumatic fever. So what happens is that you have an infection with group A sepsis or sepsis pyogenes, um, and that will generally cause like a sore throat. Um, and then your body will try and get rid of that by making specific antibodies against it. But those antibodies are also going to react against your heart tissue um, and sometimes your joint tissue as well. And because they cross-react, uh, because I guess the heart and joint tissue must be very similar to the um, group A strep um, antigen, so that's probably why. Um, and basically this will cause rheumatic heart disease. Uh, and basically clinical, uh, clinical features include joint pain, um, joint pain, cardiac valvular regurgitation, fever, and chorea, which is basically uh, involuntary unpredictable movement. Again, really doubt you have to know this, but only you will have to probably know it is group A strep, strep pyogenes. Definitely important to know. Um, yeah. Uh, and lastly, we're just going to briefly talk about um, fever of unknown origin. So pyrexia is just another fancy word for fever. So there's three main criteria you have to meet um, to say it's a fever of unknown origin. So all it means is that we have a patient, we don't really know what's going on with their fever. There's no, we can't really um, point as to what organism is causing it or what condition is causing this fever. So there's three main criteria. Fever has to be higher than 38.3 uh, degrees Celsius on at least three occasions. Um, illness has to last longer than three weeks, so that fever has to be longer than three weeks. And no diagnosis is made after one a week of hospitalisation. Um, yeah, and that's how we can then classify. We can kind of give up and go, yeah, we don't really know what's causing this. So, uh, again, I'm not sure why they would ask this on an exam, but this was um, highlighted quite uh, strongly in your lecture. So, worth knowing, I guess. And it still could be, even if there's no investigations for coming back positive, it could still be an infectious um, cause. It can be just an inflammatory thing like vasculitis. That's just inflammation of your blood vessels. And it could be a uh, neoplasm, so some sort of cancer. So you still want to figure out what's happening. Um, yep, so now we have a few questions. Um, I think Faber did this, but I'll just talk you through it. So do you guys want to have a uh, chat? Uh, put something down in the chat, which one you think it is? I have to bring up my chat just to find the chat. Just have a guess. This one you do have to know. I think this actually came up back in second year. We were doing a respiratory quiz <laughs> at the start of the year and I couldn't remember anything, so I swapped this question. Um, okay, we have some guesses. Yep, so it's lung crackles. This one um, is quite important to know. Um, you just have to know it, to be honest. <laughs> There's nothing else I can say. <laughs> um, okay, next one. Symptoms of left heart failure include all except. And always pay attention to the word except because that very well could trip you up in the exam. Uh, it's a bit mean sometimes. Have a guess. No, I really recommend with left and right heart failure to actually draw up like a table of comparisons and just learn those two tables. Um, I think that will really help you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to click on that, but <laughs> oh well. Um, so yeah, uh, so it's not swelling of the ankles. That's generally right, um, failure. And I think we have one more question. 55 year old man has infective endocarditis. What is the most likely organism that is causing his symptoms? So this one is specifically not, this is just a normal man who hasn't had any dental procedures or anything like that. So you can kind of rule out this guy. Have a guess. I won't bite. <laughs> this one's kind of hard. So this one is Staph aureus. So that's just the one, um, the general cause is Staph aureus. All the other ones, like uh, drug users, also staph aureus generally. Uh, Rodians, um, that's your uh, dental work. And fungi, that's generally your cardiac um, surgeries and your prosthetic valves are generally fungi. Yep, so that's pretty much it, I think, for all of our questions there. So now we're going to move on to ECGs. Um, so hopefully, yep, this works. 
So there's a few good resources that I think um, are good. So the ECG Made Easy is a book. Um, you can find online. I'm pretty sure with your Monash account, you don't even need to go finding PDFs. I'm pretty sure you can access a whole heap of um, textbook just using your Monash login. Um, so hopefully you can find it. And it's a really good resource. Um, I, it helped me out a lot. I think Genetic Science is also pretty good. Um, so their general medical YouTube channel um, is a really good resource. As well. And number one advice I can give you is just keep doing them and practice, practice, practice. The more you do it, the better you will become. Um, that's really my only advice there. Um, yeah. So what is the ECG? I'm going to run through the basics um, quite quickly because I think you guys have had um, Nadita give you sort of a mini lecture, hopefully, a workshop, um, and maybe have heard other people talk about it already, so I'm not going to labour this too much. The ECG basically stands for electrocardiogram, the same as the EKG, you might just see that written a little bit differently. Um, and the main thing is that it measures electrical activity in the heart, okay? It does not measure contraction of the heart muscle. I think that's something people can easily get confused. Hopefully your electrical activity leads to a heart contraction, but it's only measuring the electrical activity in the heart. So a quick recap, um, you can read this slide in your own time, but basically remember I've labelled this point already twice in my previous presentations, but your electricity starts in the SA node, goes over the right atrium, goes to the left atrium, goes down the bundled hips, goes down the um, bundle branches, your left one first, then your right one, and then it goes into your ventricular muscles for the digital community fibers. Okay. I will point out that, um, so in a normal heart, remember, your rhythm is set, uh, your heart rate is set by your SA node in a normal heart, okay, so you should remember that. So usually we refer to this as sinus rhythm, okay, so most people, your SA node will be setting it, and that's why we call it sinus rhythm, sinus node, sinus rhythm, okay. Sometimes we have something called um, bradycardia and tachycardia. So tachycardia is a heart rate of above 100 and bradycardia is a heart rate under 60. Okay? And those are two values you definitely have to know uh, for clinical skills and just in general, it's probably a good idea to know that. Okay? And we can refer to them as sinus tachycardia and sinus bradycardia. So all that means, if you get a little bit confused by them, sinus tachycardia means that the sinus, the heart is going really fast because the SA node is going really fast. Okay, if it's sinus bradycardia, the, um, it's, the heart rate is slow because the sinus atrial node is slow. Okay, that's all that means if you ever see that. It's not very high yield, it's just uh, if you get confused. Because I remember being, what is a sinus rhythm? I don't know, that's what it is. Here's a really good um, slide. Highly recommend at the end of the presentation to come back and have a look. Um, so hopefully you already kind of know what a P-wave QRS complex and a T-wave is. If not, we'll quickly run through. Um, but this just shows how you can see we have a beginning of a P-wave here. You have your um, atria depolarizing, then the start of your QRS complex is traveling down the AV node and into the ventricles. Our actual QRS complex finished here, that's your ventricular um, cells depolarizing, and then we have our T wave down here, and that's just our ventricles repolarizing. Okay, so this really beautiful diagram, I really enjoy this diagram. <laughs> I'm such a nerd, so that's fine. Uh, so this is just an overview of um, the ECG complex. So definitely 1000% have to know this back to front. Okay, it's not too hard though, all right. So our P wave is just the depolarization of the atria. Okay, so that's the P wave. Your QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricles. Now your T wave, which is this one here, is the repolarization of the ventricles. So remember repolarization, re sorry, I can't speak today. Um, that's just returning to a resting state. So it's not gonna be depolarizing anymore. It's just relaxing. Um, now you're probably wondering what is this U wave? U wave, no one really knows what a U wave is. <laughs> um, it's not always present and I haven't actually really seen many U waves. So you can just ignore that. Yeah, don't worry too much about it. Now you're probably wondering why is there no uh, repolarization of the atria represented in this complex because we have repolarization of the ventricles, um, but not the atria. And that's because that's happening at the same time as the depolarization of the ventricles. Okay, so it's just masked by this QRS complex. That's all that is. So I think I talked about it the last time as well. So these are just some definitions as to what the QRS wave is because I remember going which one's which. Um, but basically, the Q wave is just the first deflection downwards, so switch will go down. R wave is the next one, just going up, okay, just uh, anything going up. It doesn't have to be preceded by a Q wave. So you can see in example B, there's no Q wave, but there is an R wave. Any deflection following an R wave down is called an S wave, so it's this one here. 
Um, so do learn those, those are quite important to know the difference. So next I'm just gonna very briefly talk about what the ECG leads are. So again, basically the ECG, um, I guess kind of compares the activity in one node compared against another node. And so this sort of combines into looking at the heart in different directions. So your heart is a 3D structure and you can look from the top um, down, okay, sort of like a vertical sort of view. Here, this is gonna be really wrong, but you can kind of think of it as like a coronal sagittal view, like you're looking down, okay? Um, or you can look horizontally, okay? So more like a transverse view of the heart, okay? And that together, that vertical and horizontal sort of plane of the heart will give you a good 3D image of what is going on in the heart, okay? So you have six uh, limb leads, so these ones here, and you have six chest leads, so your chest leads are the ones that are just called V and then have a number. That's how you know everything else is a limb lead. So your uh, limb leads, they're the ones that are looking down, okay? Um, so they're looking vertically. So this is kind of a kind of a whack drawing, um, but this is your heart, okay, from a sort of vertical view, okay? Um, so you can see all these ones are looking at a certain uh, side of the heart, okay? So VR, I'll talk about this one first of all. So VR is actually showing your right atrium. So you can see this is, you can pretend this is the right atrium. It's quite lateral to the heart. Uh, now remember, all of your electrical activity is starting in the SO, in a healthy heart, starting in the SO node and going away from the right atrium down into the left atrium and the other ventricles, all right? So it makes sense that this VR lead is always going to be uh, showing down. Okay, see how it ever, all the waves are going down? That's because all the electrical activity is moving away from the right atrium. Okay, so if it's moving away from a node, it's going to point down. Now you can see in lead two, for example, it's very positive. Okay, even more positive than DL or three. And that's because most of the electrical activity is moving towards V2, uh, sorry, lead two. Uh, and that's why there's a positive sort of um, lead set. Okay, so in an ECG, your VR node or lead should always be um, negative. Okay, if it's not negative, either something is really wrong or you most likely put your leads on wrong. Okay, so there is a specific uh, method of putting on leads. We won't be discussing that. I don't think you need to know that in first year. You probably need to know as a doctor in the future at some point, but we don't need to know now. So all these ones look at different uh, parts of the heart. So left lateral surface of the heart is leads one, two, and DL. So one, two, and DL, you can kind of see it's left side. Inferior surface of the heart is lead three and DF. Again, you can kind of see it's looking down here. The right atrium is VR. And there's an easier way of, you do have to remember um, what looks at the left lateral surface, what looks like an inferior surface, but there's an easier way of remembering that, which I will just cover in two steps. Uh, then after limb leads, we have our chest leads, so these are all the Vs with the ones. Uh, again, remember they're looking at a more horizontal view, so looking through like the transaction, transection of the um, body here. So you can see this is the spinal cord and this is the heart here. So you can see the right ventricle is represented by V1, V2. The septum, which is this part here, V3, V4, and then the interior, anterior and lateral walls are V5 and V6. Alright, so you will have to remember that. Again, coming to how it's just easier to remember. Um, so here, here we are, this is how you remember what leads look at what. So these here, these are all your chest leads, all your Vs, okay, and all the other ones here are your limb leads, so it's all nice and nicely. I would just suggest um, just memorising like this picture, okay. If you memorise this picture, you will know lead 2, 3 and ABF look at the inferior part of the heart. You know, these, uh, the first four uh, chest leads look at the anterior septal part of the heart. So just remember this, if you can draw this out 50 times perfectly, you've got it. And this will come back probably for the rest of your life, so definitely remember it, okay? So if we know, for example, why this is really important, if we have um, a heart attack, okay, and we see something going wrong in these ones here, so the anterior and septal ones, so pink and um, blue, um, you'll know that that heart attack is lo um, localised to the anterior septal part of the heart. If you see a pathology just affecting the first lead, AVL, V5, V6, you know that it's a pathology, a heart attack probably in the lateral side of the heart, okay? And that's why it's really important to know this. And most likely in the exam, what they would do, they would either give you this and they give you a very obvious heart attack pathology, so an ST elevation, we'll come back to that, and they'll ask you what part of the heart is affected and maybe what artery um, is going wrong. Or they'll give you just one, um, one of these, so they won't give you 12 
um, boxes, or I'll just give you one, and they'll ask you what um, arrhythmia is present. So we'll talk about it in a second. So if you do see 12, you're probably looking for a heart attack. That's my tip. So this is just where they're actually placed on leaves. I'm not gonna cover this in too much detail. I don't think we need to know this at all. This is just for your own reference. So we're gonna just talk about actually getting to the nitty gritty of things. So, the, so basically we have a 12 lead ECG. That means we have these 12 little boxes here. Um, but you can see at the bottom, we have a long one here. That's generally always lead two. Um, I don't really know why they put it at the bottom. I think it's mainly, I, I personally use it to calculate the heart rate because you can kind of see it's the clearest one. Um, and it goes for the longest. So it's just easiest to calculate heart rate. That's why I would suggest using heart rate, do it from the um, rhythm strip at the bottom, which is lead two, okay? So lead two is the same thing as here. They're just dragged about for a while. So there are some steps in interpreting ECGs. I know this sounds really redundant and they're like, oh, this is so obvious and it is obvious. However, I put this in here because um, you'll be having offies and stuff um, from next year. Uh, and you will be expected to come into an OSCE and interpret an ECG. And if you miss one of these details, it is really not good. Um, so you have to make sure, get into the habit, even if you're just doing like in the exam, going, okay, I would check the patient's name. I check the date and time of when this ECG was taken. Um, and that gets you into a really good habit in general. Um, you want to make sure you have the correct details. You don't want to accidentally be interpreting, you know, a ventricular like epicardia or something and have it be the wrong patient and treating the wrong patient. So it's a good idea to just get into the habit of doing this. So after you've checked the sort of details, you check the calibration signal, which we'll talk in a second. Then you look at technical errors, which we'll also talk in a second. Then you look at the rate. So rate is just the heart rate, how fast it's going. Rhythm, all I mean by rhythm is that, is it normal rhythm or is there something going funky in the ECG? That's sort of the nitty gritty part of this interpretation. And then lastly, we look at the electrical axis. Um, today, I'll probably be talking about the electrical axis actually a bit before the rhythm, because I think that's a bit trickier to understand. So yeah, we'll go through that. So now I'm just going to explain what the actual grids mean. Um, sometimes it's easy to forget what these all mean. So definitely spend a little bit of time getting this in your head. So we have some large squares and we have some small squares. The large squares, which are five millimeters, represent 0.2 seconds. Okay, and each small square is one millimeter and that's 0 0.04 seconds. All right, so you can imagine five, li five large squares is about a second. And from these squares, um, they're really useful because sometimes your, P your um, waves might be too big, too wide, too small, whatever it is. So you, you do have to know like uh, each square is, um, small square is one millimeter, every large square is five millimeters, so it's helpful. Um, so then the details, the name, patient, date and time. Calibration signal, I absolutely have to make sure you check this. So calibration signals are just at the start, before you're running the ECG, you send this through one millivolt of electricity and that should show a peak of one centimetre, which is about two large squares, because remember one large square is 0.5. Um, yeah, and then you check for technical errors. So technical errors, there's a few that you could see. Um, again, in an exam, you probably won't be asked this, but for general knowledge, so sometimes in, in an ECG, um, you should have a very straight baseline. So I'll just give a hand. Oh gosh, that's not gonna be good to give a hand. Okay, here we go. So you can see in this ECG, this is a normal ECG. We have our calibration signal, two large squares roughly. So that's all good. And the baseline is quite straight. Okay, so obviously there's still waves happening, but it's fairly straight. If you had a baseline just going down the page, that means something's gone wrong, all right? Um, the other two things that could go wrong is that a patient could be shivering because they're cold, okay, or something's going on. Um, and that might look a little bit like V-fib, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but basically your ECG will look really weird and it'll be very chaotic and there probably won't be any straight lines or anything like that. Um, so you can just Google for fun shivering ECG. They're pretty interesting to look at. And lastly, really important to check your VR node. Uh, VR lead, sorry, I keep saying that really wrong. Uh, that lead is negative, okay? It has to be negative. If it is positive, you probably have your lead back on the wrong way. That's the most important thing. Okay, so heart rate, um, there's two different ways of calculating the heart rate, either 300 divided by the number of big squares between two R waves, or 1,500 divided by the number of small squares between two R waves. Just pick one, don't memorize both. I like this one because it's easier, <laughs> easier math. <laughs> uh, so just choose one, don't, if you memorize more than, if you memorize both, you might get confused. So just, I recommend option one, just go for it. And again, I just have bradycardia and tachycardia. Tachycardia, 100 beats per minute um, and uh, bradycardia less than 60. 
definitely important to know and you very well might pass. So this is just uh, a table showing if you really love memorizing things, <laughs> I'm very jealous you do, um, but if you really love memorizing things, uh, you can have a go. So um, this is just the interval, the number of large squares between the R waves. So if there's one interval, your heart rate is 300 beats per minute, which I'm not sure your patient is okay <laughs> if it's that high. Yes, it's not good. Um, so yeah, this just gives you an uh, approximate um, what's going on with the R waves and heart rate. But this is just if you are completely up. So you can basically, this is just showing that the closer that R interval, the higher the heart rate. Second point. And I'm just going to skim through this. Um, so P wave, as I said, atrial depolarization should be less than 2.5 millimeters, which is half a large square, and should be uh, wider than, uh, sorry, less, less than three millimeters uh, in width. Okay, it is important to know this because um, we'll be coming back to this in a second, but sometimes you can have wider P waves and sometimes you have taller P waves and they're not normal. So you have to know what is a tall and what is a wide P wave. So please remember that. PR interval, so PR interval is important. It just shows um, the length of time between the atrial depolarization and the ventricular depolarization. So it's the time from the SA node into the AV node and then into the ventricles, okay? And usually that's three to five small squares, all right? If it's too short, um, that can mean that there's, um, the atria has been depolarized from close to the AV node instead of the SA node, um, or there's abnormally fast conduction. But we'll come, that's just a very minor, very low yield point. Um, high yield point is AV block, which we'll be coming back when we talk about each pathology section. QRS complex is just the depolarization of the ventricles. Um, again, I just highlight it's not the contraction, please don't get confused. Your contraction will come after the depolarization. Normally, it should be less than three small squares. Um, that's in width, not height. <laughs> um, sorry, I should, I should have clarified that. If it's longer, it means the depolarization is taking longer. You can think about it, you know, there's more squares, taking more time, thus depolarization is taking longer. Um, yeah, that's the main thing there. Um, so this is just showing you, this is just talking about what the QRS waves actually are. Um, I already kind of talked about this before. Q wave and QT interview, uh, interval, uh, Q wave is any negative deflection of perceived in R wave. And the QT interval is the start uh, from the Q wave to the T wave. Um, and basically that represents the ventricular depolarization and repolarization. So you can imagine in between the depolarization and the repolarization, you would would have had a ventricular contraction happen, all right? So ventricular sistole would have taken place. That's what QT um, shows ventricular sistole. Um, then you have your ST segment and your T wave, T wave, sorry, I can't pronounce those at all today, it's really bad. Um, so the ST segment is the period when the ventricles are actually contracting, okay? So that's really important, the ventricular sistole. And T wave is the repolarization, so the ventricle muscle is resting, just relaxing. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the cardiac access. So I remember last year being really super confused about this. I'm gonna try and make it as simple as possible, all right? If you want more information, you can come chat to me after ECG, after this presentation, um, message me, or I can direct you to the book. Um, ECG is made easy, I think it was called. It's really good, it has a bit more detail about cardiac access. Basically, all of it the cardiac access is, is that it's a uh, measure of the average direction of uh, depolarization, okay? So this here, these two pictures, um, this is just showing in a normal heart, where is your uh, um, electricity going on average? So you can see here on the left, your electricity is going towards lead two, okay? It's always gonna be positive and it's going away from VR, all right? This is what I talked about earlier. VR is always negative because it's traveling away from the right atrium, okay? So on average, your um, electricity in the heart, in a normal heart, is going towards leads one, two, and three. Okay, it's just going down to this sort of bottom uh, corner here. That's really important to note. That's what's happening in a normal heart. Sometimes we have something go wrong in that this electricity stops going in the right direction. Sometimes it might go this way or it might go that way. It might go anywhere, okay? And that's abnormal. We want it going in the direction of one, two, and three normally. And that's just the average. So we have this picture here, all right? Kind of, you can kind of ignore all the degrees. I don't think they really match up and you don't have to memorize 
you know, leave three is here, leave the F is here, don't have to do any of that. This is just, um, so what they actually have done is they've mapped out all the vectors or the leaves um, as vectors and they put it here and it just tells them, okay, so as long as the average um, depolarization is in this direction, this is normal, all right? So you don't really need to know anything um, about this just yet. So what we do is that this is a normal, okay, it's from negative 30 to positive 90, okay, this is a normal cardiac axis. If we're in this little little um, piece here, this is called left axis deviation. If we're in this entire quadrant down here, this is right axis deviation. You can also land in this uh, quadrant up here, and this is no man's land. Uh, it's not very important, it's not very high yield. I'll come, I'll explain this a bit more now. So in the normal axis, what we do, we, uh, as I said, if we go back to this slide, lead one and lead two should be positive. Okay, they should always be positive in a normal heart because most, on average, most of your electrical activity is going towards lead one and two. Okay, if it's going towards, you're going to have a positive spike um, in this here. You're going to have a positive deflection up. So what I mean by positive and negative is that we have to have a look. So when I say positive lead, I mean that the net QRS complex is more positive. It has a more positive area. It's going upwards. If I say a lead is negative, I'm again looking at the QRS complex, and you can see how it's deflected downwards, all right, and it's a lot more negative than it is positive. Right? That's what I mean when I say positive or negative uh, lead, okay, looking at the QRS complex. And specifically, you'll have to pay attention to lead one, AVF, and sometimes lead two in interpreting your um, cardiac axis, so we'll come back to that. So here, you can see we only have positive lead one and positive lead two, because there's more a positive upward deflection up, okay, lead one and two. So how I like to think about it, lead one on the cardiac axis is looking at the vertical half of this circle. So lead one, you can see it's, it's, it's gonna be yellow on the right half, vertical half, okay, that's positive. If lead one was negative, we'd be looking at this, that hopefully you can all see my mouse, tell me if I'm not, but you can see that lead one, if it was negative, it'd be this left vertical half here. Okay, now the normal heart, lead one is always positive. So we're looking at this side. In a normal heart, lead two is always positive. Okay, and lead two is shown by this blue here, and it's obviously overlapping with the yellow to make it green. Uh, hopefully you remember that from primary school, <laughs> high yield info. Um, so you can see this lead two, the positive lead two is represented by this almost diagonal line here. Okay, so this diagonal line, this bottom right half is positive lead two. This top left half is negative lead two. So again, in a normal heart, you have positive lead one, so the right vertical side, and positive lead two, the positive um, right bottom diagonal side. Now again, this wouldn't be enough because the axis is the average of the heart um, activity, okay? So how we find the average is just where they overlap. And these two overlap in this, uh, quadrant here from that negative 30 to that positive 90. That's why we have a normal axis from here to here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, have a think about it. It's just again, lead one is that vertical half, lead two is that diagonal half. Um, I'm just going to continue on. I'm just going to skip ahead. Now, AVF is also important because as you can see, lead one is this vertical half here, positive here, negative here. So I'm really trying to drive that point home. AVF is showing the horizontal segment, okay? So AVF is positive on the bottom, okay? And negative on the top, this whole quadrant here. And you can see in the normal axis, this is missing that lead two, this is why I don't like this diagram as much, it's missing that lead two diagonal bit here, but your uh, right uh, lower quadrant here is always gonna be normal because you're overlapping positive lead one and uh, positive AVF and AVF should, AVF can either be positive or negative in a normal heart. Um, and if it's negative, we land in this quadrant and as we know, that might still be normal. Okay, that depends on lead two to be normal here in this quadrant. So we'll go back to this. If you're really struggling to understand, because I know I remember last year being so bamboozled about what was going on. Um, if you're really um, finding it hard, you can have a go at just throat memorizing this. I really suggest against that though. I think if you do understand it and you can memorize this diagram at least, that will really help you out and that will set you up completely to determine any cardiac axis. So to determine the cardiac axis, again, we're looking at that QRS where it's more positive or negative. 
So in the normal, uh, we'll start with right axis deviation because I think that's a bit easier. So in right axis deviation, we're looking at the vertical half. So um, lead one is negative, so we're in this one, and AVF is positive, so we're here. So lead one, vertical negative, AVF positive here, they overlap in this quadrant here, a right axis deviation. So that's how we know a uh, heart is deviated. We have no, um, no man's land, so I'll put a north west, but that doesn't really matter. Um, this is where both lead one and AVF are negative. Okay, so lead one, vertical on the left, AVF uh, negative at the top, overlap um, here. All right, that's how you know that. Now let's have a talk about um, determining normal versus left axis deviation. So if you have a positive lead one and a positive AVF, here, that's all good, you're normal. Okay, that's the easiest one to get. Okay, because positive lead one, this vertical half, positive AVF, this bottom half overlap here. Now, in this quadrant, it gets a little bit trickier. It's not that tricky, okay, I promise, um, but it, it, it is a bit of an annoying one. <laughs> so you have in this quadrant, it's not enough to know whether, it's enough to know a lead one is positive, because that lands you in this quadrant, um, this half, positive half. Now, AVF can either be positive or negative, okay, in this one. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, oh, sorry, not, not negative, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> so in this one, you have uh, negative AVF. Okay, I don't know why that says positive, that should be a negative there. Anyway, so because we're looking at this top half, which is negative AVF. So then, if you're stuck in this quadrant, it's not good enough to know whether it's left axis deviation or normal, it could be both. So we have a look at lead two. This is the only time we use lead two to determine left axis deviation or normal. Okay, so remember, our diagonal here is lead two, and in a normal heart, lead two is positive. That's why it places us here, all right, for this normal heart. Um, now, in a left axis deviation, your lead two, which would be sort of this half, this, this top left half, that be negative and places you in left axis deviation. That's how you find out left axis deviation. I hope that made sense. Um, if not, come talk to me after this presentation. I can go through it again or message me. Um, yeah, because it is a little bit tricky, I promise you. But hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, and these are just some pictures to again demonstrate the overlaps between them, have a look at them in your own time. So there's some specific causes of left axis deviation, right axis deviation, and no man's land. Very unlikely you'd be asked, okay? First of all, left axis deviation can be caused by left ventricular hypertrophy and right axis deviation by right ventricular hypertrophy. And this makes perfect sense because again, axis, um, cardiac axis is showing the average electrical activity and what direction it's going. So if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, you have more electrical activity in the left side of the heart. Thus, it's gonna cause more average electrical activity in the left side, leading to left axis deviation and vice versa for right axis deviation. Uh, now, with left axis deviation, it can also be a conduction defect. It can be all these other things, highly, highly unlikely to be asked. Okay, at all, so don't really bother. Right axis deviation, there are two other things I think are worth on. I think the data told us that we should know this. And it can be a normal finding in children and tolls in adults, and it can also be a pulmonary embolism. Okay, that's the only, only two things you really need to memorize. No man's land, don't worry about it. Okay, you don't really need to know anything about it. Yeah, so now we're gonna move on to some ECG, ECG pathology. So when you're interpreting an ECG, um, and Adida has a very good way of going through it very thoroughly and systematically. So go back to her notes and read through, go, okay, looking at P waves and looking at this brass wave, looking at those T waves, looking at the PR interval. She has a very systematic way of doing it, which is really good, okay? And that's how I recommend in the exam when you're doing them to go through that systematic way. Work out the heart rate um, and then look at every single wave on its own and then the intervals and go through them. Sometimes though, I know uh, I found it really overwhelming last year, especially to just look at a 12 lead ECG up on one um, and just go, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where to start looking, all right? So if you're really, really stressed out, sometimes you might just look at, because you might not know what an abnormal P wave really looks like unless you've done a heap of practice. And in two weeks, I don't know how, you know, with all your other revision, how it's going. So sometimes it helps just to have in the back of your mind all the different pathologies that could be happening if you're really struggling, okay? So you can kind of work backwards from it um, if you're having a, a harder time with it, which is totally okay. So the first one we're gonna talk about are the different types of AV blocks. So remember AV block is just when depolarization from the SA node is just not getting through to the ventricles, all right? And the AV node is just kind of screwing that up. So sometimes it just delays it a little bit longer and sometimes there's just nothing getting through. And remember I talked about last time, 
the um, atrium and ventricles can be just doing their own thing. They have no relation to each other. Okay. So first degree AV block, okay, is not the kind of says first degree, second degree, and third degree. First degree is not too bad, second degree is getting worse, third degree is where there's no relation between your atrium and ventricles. Okay, so I kind of think about them as getting worse and worse. So first degree AV block um, is basically when the depolarization is just delayed a little bit. Okay. Um, so, because it's delayed, you can think about your PR interval just being long, okay? So, it's going to be more than one large sweat. And that's how you know it's first degree block. However, every P wave is still always going to be followed by a QRS wave, okay? Every P wave followed by a QRS wave. It's just a long PR interval, okay? But every time there's a P and a QRS, that makes it first degree. Now, second degree AV block type one is a little bit different. So again, you have a longer PR interval, but it's getting longer and then longer and then longer and then it disappears, all right? So it sort of runs out of steam. So this is a bit different and this is very regular. PR interval is gonna be like the same, okay? It's just long. Whereas here it gets longer and longer and longer until there's just suddenly no conduction, okay? So there won't be a QRS following a P wave. That's type one, all right? And it has the same sort of cycle, goes on and on and on, okay? So it's pretty, uh, okay. Uh, type two, um, kind of similar, except that, um, I mean, it's kind of different, <laughs> sorry. Um, but basically you have your P wave, okay? And everything's going normal, you know, everything's fine, and suddenly there's no QRS, okay? This is a very sudden drop off. Um, the difference, this one gets longer and longer, longer and drops off. This one, everything is normal, and randomly there's no QRS. Okay, so you don't have to um, remember that. Um, so then we have a specific subset of second degree AV blocks. So we have something called two to one, three to one, four to one. That sounds really complicated, but trust me, it's not. So just talking about how an AV block sometimes you don't have a QRS. So you can see in this one, we have a P wave here and then no QRS. We have a P wave here and we do have a QRS. Two to one just refers to the fact there's two P waves and then one QRS. Here we have two P waves and then one two and then one, so two to one, all right? Sometimes you can have three P waves and then a QRS, or you can have four P, P waves before a QRS. That's all that refers to. Very unlikely to be asked this in an exam though, so really highly doubt it. Third degree block, again, this is the most severe one where it's just nothing getting through to the ventricles. Your atria and your ventricles are just doing their own thing, okay? It's not a very fun time for either of them. Uh, so here, this is kind of a fun ECG in that there's no relation at all between the P waves and QRS. So you can see here, all the little arrows are pointing to your um, P waves. So here you have three P waves before a QRS, here you have two, here you have one. So it's really very random, okay? Um, I think that's always kind of hard when you're interpreting third degree A block to be like, oh, I don't know what's going on. If you're really unsure, have a think about do the P and the QRS um, complexes, do they match up or do they not? So next we're going to talk about bundle branch blocks. So this is when there's abnormal conduction um, through either the right or left bundle branch. Um, so remember the bundle branch is the one going from the AV node into the ventricles and um, into the PCG fibers. So remember that uh, in your heart, just a fun fact, um, your left heart uh, depolarizes before your right. That's, that's important to know. So left bundle branch block, these kind of annoy me because they kind of look hard. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so basically, if you're thinking about how there's a delay in your ventricular depolarization, that means your QRS complex is going to be wide. So if you see a wide QRS complex, it's either left or right bundle branch block. They both have that in common. Okay, so if you see wide, you're thinking, aha, uh -huh, bundle branch block. Now, the way to tell the difference. Um, is that left bundle branch block will have M-shaped R waves in V5 and V6. So we have a look at V5, V6, you can see that it looks like you know, Mac is fine, <laughs> M waves, all right? And then we have W-shaped S waves in uh, V1. So you can kind of see it has this funky little um, uh, W wave here, all right? And how we can remember that is we're using mnemonic, mnemonic Williams. That has saved me so many times with mnemonic. I love it so much. So it's looking from W for V1, M is we'll see V5 and V6, so the opposite ends, and L in the middle stands for left, okay? Because the right bundle branch block is the same, but opposite. So again, Y QRS complex, but M shaped R waves in V1, okay, instead of V6 like it was, and W shaped S waves in V6. So you can see we have that V6. Mnemonic here is marrow, all right? So M shaped in V1, 
belly shaped in S wave, um, sorry, belly shaped S wave in V6, and it's in the right bundle branch block. So I highly recommend using these mnemonics, this is the only way I can do these. <laughs> um, very, very helpful. And they are in the middle is for right, L is for left. And you do have to, you could very well be asked this question in the exam. Then we just have um, ectopic things, so extra systole. This means that your heart is just doing its own thing and then randomly decides, oh, time for another contraction. All right, so an ectopic beat is an extra beat. All right, so you can see here, it's going pretty normal, okay? But then there's just this random one in the middle that's just happening. That's your extra system or ectopic beat. Um, I can see this ECG, this kind of looks like to me, it could also be an ectopic beat here, but I'm also not too sure. It does look like it's come back a bit quicker. Yeah. Atrial flutter. Your so atrial flutter um, is basically when your atria are contracting really, really super duper fast. Okay, and they're contracting so fast um, and they're depolarizing so fast that the, the QRS complex doesn't have time to even depolarize. Okay, that's why you kind of have missing QRS complexes. This is very similar to an AV block. Okay, it kind of is, but ignore that. Um, with atrial flutter, what makes it a bit different is that it has a sawtooth appearance. You can see it really, it's very jagged, all right, in QRS, jaggy, jaggy, jaggy. Um, that's your buzzword, so very well could say that in an exam. Okay, so you see this, very classic atrial flutter. Atrial fibrillation, another buzzword, irregularly irregular. Um, so basically, when something is fibrillating, it means that it's just all the individual fibers are contracting independently. So, you know, the muscles are supposed to be a syncytium, we talked about that, it's just um, all the fibers contracting at the same time um, to pump out all the blood at the same time. Yeah, in fibrillation, that doesn't happen and each fiber is just wanting to do its own thing. There is no organized contraction, okay? Um, and that's why in AFib, you get this irregularly irregular pattern, okay? So you don't have any P waves, all right? Because if you're atrial fibrillating, they don't have time to depolarize or anything. Okay, so there's no P waves. Um, but the QRS complexes can still happen, all right, because your AV node has probably taken over at that point, but they're not very organized still, so they happen at irregular times, hence irregularly irregular. All right, that's important. AFib is pretty bad because it can cause heart attacks and strokes, um, so that's why we want to pick up on that. Ventricular fibrillation is <laughs> even worse, okay. Uh, VFib, there's no, I have not even seen anyone try to like define what a VFib looks like. Basically, if your ECG is total chaos, it's VFib, it could also be shivering. Okay? You can probably tell if your patient is shivering or is currently almost dying. You probably can tell the difference. So this um, ECG is totally um, chaotic. It's just, you can't tell, you can't even see like a P wave or the QRS. There's no, no clue what's going on, so VFib. And that's very dangerous because VFib will lead to cardiac arrest very quickly. So it needs to be researched. So when we do defibrillation, okay, um, it's a bit of a misnomer to think that heart has stopped beating and we can restart it. We can't do that, okay? When there's no electrical activity, there's no electrical activity. However, VFib, we can still reset the heart, okay? Because we can give a shock with a um, defibrillator, if you've seen one of those things, and we can start, we can sort of restart it into a normal, normal heart rhythm, okay? So if you see this, you're running to your defibrillator. Um, then we have left atrial hypertrophy. So left atrial hypertrophy, we have, um, again, buzzword, bifid and broad P wave. So by bifid, you can see there's like two small peaks and they're quite a broad P wave, all right? Bigger than those three small squares. And this is generally due to mitral stenosis. You can think about that because um, it's trying to compensate for that stenosis. Again, you can think about it, um, it makes sense, there's bifid and broad, because if there's less atrial hypertrophy, it's taking more time um, to go through. That's why it's going to be um, a bit wider. Right, atrial hypertrophy, again, P waves, but they're tall, okay? Uh, again, this is used to try cast with vastinosis or pulmonary hypertension, just trying to compensate for that. So again, you can, you can see in this ECG that P waves are basically as tall as the QRS complexes, which is not good. Um, okay, this one, this is my least favorite, left ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy. You actually have to like spend time and think about it, but like doing that. <laughs> um, so again, left ventricular hypertrophy, that's when you have more muscle mass in your left ventricle and they're trying to compensate for whatever it is. So how we do this, this is just something you want to have to rote learn. There's no really way of doing this. So for left ventricular hypertrophy, looking at your S wave steps in V1 and V2, 
pick one, I go for V1, right? Plus your R wave height in V5 or V6, again, pick one, I pick V5, um, and then combined is bigger than 35 millimeters, okay? I uh, remember one square is five millimeters, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's a lot, there's a way bigger than 35 already, okay? You can tell this is a really massive ventricular hypertrophy. Five ventricle hypertrophy, again, kind of the opposite. So instead of the S wave depth in V1, it's R wave height in V1, and S wave depth in V5 or V6. Right? And that has to be bigger than 10 millimeters um, for it to be a right ventricle hypertrophy. That makes sense. You can kind of remember the left one has to be 35, the right one is 10 because your left ventricle is bigger. Okay, so there's just going to be more electricity is happening there than in your right ventricle. And then unfortunately, you just have to memorize the R wave and V1, S wave and V1. Silly, anyway, you just have to memorize that, unfortunately. Um, then we have um, ST elevations. I think Faye would briefly mention this. But basically, um, in acute myofibular infarction, so heart attack, um, or sometimes pericarditis as well, so that's inflammation of your pericardium, you can see something called an ST elevation. So in a normal, um, you can see up here, you have an elevated ST segment, so S and then T is this segment here, but you also have a depressed segment here as well. Now normally that would be in line with your baseline and would just be going on, okay, whereas here it's elevated and here it's depressed. If you see an elevation, that generally means acute MI or pericarditis, uh, depressed ST can also actually mean um, acute MI, but it's not as common as an elevated ST. So ST elevation, you're thinking heart attack, okay? Now, how you can tell the difference between a heart attack or pericarditis? Heart attack, remember, that's localised to a part of the heart, okay? So you can see in this ECG here, you have um, segments here quite clearly elevated, S and P here, S and T here, ST here, and ST here elevated, okay? And that's localised. So if you remember from that colourful diagram, this is why you have to remember, um, this is the anterior septal part of the heart. So there's a heart attack present here. If it was elevated everywhere, every single segment was elevated everywhere, that would be pericarditis. Because pericarditis is not localised, it's just a whole pericardium, and that's how you can tell. Um, but generally, ST elevation is above 30 for acute M1. Uh, yeah. And that's why, this is why you have to know your parts of the heart really, really well. Then we can tell um, old myocardial infarcts, so, so we can have something called deep Q waves, um, and they're indicative of a previous MI. Again, you would check, so for example, this would lead to, you'd be checking here, um, and we know what part of the heart that is. Okay, so that's quite good. Then we have inverted T waves. Okay, so inverted T waves, again, just some form of ischemia. All right. Again, remember T waves, everything is positive except an AVR, okay? If AVR is negative, that's fine. You can see here, lead three and VF, they're showing inverted T waves. That means there's an ischemia happening there, okay? So heart attack, not cool. So this is just an ACG example of a left axis deviation. Um, so let's go through it. So um, we know in the left axis deviation, our QRS complex is positive in lead one, okay? So we're in this part of the heart. Then negative in AVF, all right, so on this side, and then negative in L2. Okay, so we're here, so we're in this quadrant here. So have a look at uh, L1, we are positive, see our QRS is quite high. AVF is quite negative down here, you can see it's mostly negative, and then lead 2 is also negative. Okay, so that's how you can tell. Right axis deviation quite uh, simple, I think this one's easier than left. There's only two you have to look at. Um, it's negative in L1, so again, we'll go here negative side here for L1, and then positive AVF here, lands you by axis deviation. So we're negative in lead one, and then we're positive in AVF here. I hope that makes sense. Um, again, with your cardiac axis, go back to all those previous diagrams and try and figure that out. All right, so I have, I think, oh, here we go. This is really important. If you're struggling for time, I remember this time last year, I was like, oh my God, there's so much to remember. I don't remember anything. Um, this will save your life, okay? Just you can rote learn this if you really want to. Obviously not ideal, but you know, this time of year, especially since you guys also have to do SEM1, um, I understand it's quite tricky. So have a go uh, if you're really stressed, having a look at this quick summary of all the different pathologies that could happen. All right, so this will help you. Um, okay, I think I have, I think I only have like three practice questions. Um, we'll have a go, all right? I kind of pick tricky ones, um, so we'll see, we'll see how we go, all right?
Uh, I don't even give you multiple choice, but if someone can guess what's happening. Um, and I'm happy to give you guys a hint. So I'll give you a minute. That's very fast, <laughs> good luck. If you guys want, if you guys are not sure about what pathology it is, you can just throw in the chat what looks abnormal. Just in general, does anything sort of like come out at you that looks really weird? I can't even see the chat, I don't know why it's not opening. Oh, okay, I think someone has actually got it. Yeah, so this is left bundle branch block. Okay, so here, if you can see in this one, what sort of jumps out of you, um, as you can see, I know it's really hard, especially when you put with an ECD, like where do I look, what lead do I look, like it's really overwhelming. Um, I suggest, <laughs> and this is gonna be bad, um, but to rule out your ventricular hypertrophies and your bundle branch block, look at, the, like, look at all of the um, chest leads first, I would say. Okay, having a look at them, if there's any obvious M waves, for example, in V5 and V6, you can see there's quite obvious M waves here, all right? But if you didn't get that, you know, time, if you sadly won and looking through all this, like by the time you, you know, you looked at this last, okay? So that's why I suggest looking at your uh, chest leads, they're just a little bit more informative, I think. So you can see you have your M waves here, and that should be indicative of that um, left bundle branch block. I remember we have our mnemonic William, and you can see in V1 as well. You have these kind of, they look very deep as well. Okay, so the, the, something is just not looking quite right. Again, you you will know this in time with more practice you do, you'll just pick up on what looks okay and what doesn't look okay. All right, so it just takes time. Um, so we use our mnemonic, so if you remember, okay, W and V1, M and uh, V6, okay, so W, first letter, William, left bundle, right block. Okay, that's how you do it. Um, Okay, and of course you should have picked up on the fact that these are quite wide QRS complexes as well. All right, next one, this is also a tricky one. Sorry to be mean. <laughs> you didn't, someone got it, that's good. Uh, this time I'll share up with one of the I will say with this one, this one is actually kind of a bad ECG. And why is it a bad ECG? It's because it's probably actually a little bit of technical error. So you can see, um, if you go back and you did it systematically, you would have probably picked up on the fact that our baseline is really, really wonky. Okay, you can see it's not a very straight line. This one's going down, this one's somewhere up there. Um, so this is actually not a really great ECG. And hopefully the people would have redone an ECG because this is very good. However, um, I remember <laughs> this year we actually had a class with Medita and she gave us a wonky ECG. And I was like, oh, I don't have to interpret it. This is a wonky. She was like, no, no, you can still use it to interpret it. <laughs> so that was kind of sad. Um, so you can still actually interpret things. Um, so there's some really good suggestions in the chat and I can see why you're all thinking that. Um, so this is a right ventricular hypertrophy. All right. So again, as I suggest, having a look at um, your chest leads first. I think they're most helpful. Um, so this one is hard. I think right why I did this one. I think right ventricular hypertrophy is the most subtle one to pick up, especially if you haven't had a lot of practice. Because your R waves uh, and your S waves, they only have to be bigger than 10 
millimeters, which is not a lot, okay? If that's very, very small, and if you're not used to knowing how big they should be, it's really hard to pick up that this is actually quite big for right ventricular hypertrophy, all right? This is just why um, I think this is the hardest one to pick up on. So again, you're looking at the ROF height in uh, V1 and SOS depth in V5 bigger than 10 millimeters, that means right ventricular hypertrophy, all right? But this one was a really mean one, I'm sorry. Uh, you just have to practice, okay? Uh, all right, and yeah, I see why some people are saying heart attack because uh, all the baseline is really wonky, so it could look like an ST elevation. It's not though, it's just the baseline is wonky. That's why I think um, people are confused. So this was a mean one from my part. This one I think is slightly easier to actually see what's going on. So this is why I say in an exam, if they're asking you straight up just a pathology, they'd likely just give you one of these. If they're asking heart attack or like a ventricular hypertrophy or bundle branch block, you'll likely get a whole, uh, probably an ECG. So that's just a, a sneaky way of maybe, not 100% of what every time, they might not, but it is a sneaky way of figuring out what might be asking you. Yep, so. I think someone got that, that's really good. Yeah, this is again, you just have to memorize it, but you can kind of remember left atrial hypertrophy, if it's bigger, it's just gonna be taking more time, okay? So you're gonna have broader uh, P waves with that sort of like two fix, that's because of mitral stenosis. So I think that's all the questions I have. Um, so well done for getting through that.